Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, rights organisations, survivors and the loved ones of migrants allegedly killed by a death squad on the orders of Yaya Jame are trying to get the former Gambian leader extradited from Equatorial Guinea and prosecuted. Also, following the funerals of dozens of people killed in Burundi amidst an atmosphere of heightened political tension, we hear from the UN Human Rights Commission about its concerns about Thursday's referendum. That could extend the president's term until 2034. And in South Africa, the ANC proposal to allow land redistribution without compensation has led to an increase in land occupations by residents of informal settlements forced out after their homes have been destroyed by authorities. But first, rights groups and families of people disappeared during the rule of Gambia's former leader are trying to prosecute Yaya Jame over the deaths of more than 50 West African migrants in 2005. Jame fled to Equatorial Guinea last January after losing elections. Witnesses accuse him of ordering a notorious paramilitary unit called the Junglers to carry out the killings. The men in these photos were killed in Gambia 13 years ago. On Wednesday, two NGOs, Human Rights Watch and Trial International, accused former Gambian President Yaya Jame of being behind the killings. More than 50 migrants, most of them from Ghana, were suspected of being mercenaries who wanted to overthrow Jame. They were shot dead. Crimes against humanity should not be tolerated anywhere in the world. That's what we're saying. And that includes Africa. And so Africa needs to stand up and say, well, we've had enough. And that's what this campaign is doing. And we, are, we ourselves are going to go after an excitator. And we ourselves are going to ensure that he gets tried. And we ourselves are going to ensure that he's found guilty. A UN report initially concluded the migrants were executed by rogue members of the security services. But the two NGOs interviewed 30 former officials, including 11 officers, and concluded Jame gave the orders to a notorious paramilitary unit called the Junglers. Martin Kiri is the only known survivor. At the time I was about to escape, one of my guys told me that it's God who wants to save you so that you can tell the world what and how Ye Jame have killed us. So, you know, responsibility is there on me to know, to tell, and to make people aware. Jame's 22-year rule was marked by numerous human rights violations. He lost the December 2016 election to opposition leader Adama Barrow. He only conceded defeat after several weeks and then left to settle in Equatorial Guinea. Activists hope he will one day be extradited and face trial for the many crimes he is accused of having committed. 28 people killed in an attack in northwestern Burundi have been buried this week. There are different accounts of the possible motives for last Friday's attack by unidentified gunmen in the village of Ruhamaga. But the violence comes amidst a tense build-up to a referendum that could extend President Pierre Kronzis' rule until 2034. More than 1,000 people have been killed in unrest caused by his successful bid for a third mandate that, start, that was back in 2015. There's been international concern about state-sponsored crimes amidst the tense political atmosphere and fears of more bloodshed leading into Thursday's vote. Earlier on, I spoke with Rupert Colville from the UN High Commission for Human Rights, who told me more about concerns for Thursday's vote. Uh, we're very concerned what may happen um, tomorrow, sort of during during the polling, and particularly when the results are announced, um, because historically, there's uh, sometimes the polls uh, polls results have met with the extreme violence uh, in Burundi. So we're very, very concerned about that, and we hope the authorities do their utmost to make sure that doesn't happen. So do you believe that there can be a positive outcome to the vote either way? It's going to be very, you know, it's very tense already, and it's going to remain very tense. The, uh, as you rightly say, is, you know, hugely controversial, um, and the country is so divided. Uh, so the atmosphere is, is really dangerous. I mean, this is a country with a, a long historical record of extreme violence uh, and killings on a huge scale. And there's been a steady stream of, of serious human rights violations over the past three years. So it, there's a real risk that uh, tomorrow and the, and the following days and weeks uh, um, things could explode. And so we really urge both sides, the, the government and the opposition, to, to show maximum restraint and some responsibility to try and ensure that doesn't happen, because no, there will be no winners if that happens. 
Now, now, last month, the ruling party member who urged government supporters to target opponents was jailed. Do you not feel that the government's claims that the referendum will be free and fair are genuine? Well, I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, that was a positive step. I mean, there are in many killings and many people who haven't been brought to justice uh, for those killings and for the hate speech and so on. Um, that said, you know, President Nguyen Ziza has, has called for on his supporters not to take reprisals against people who don't vote yes tomorrow. So that also is positive. Whether his supporters will abide by that is another matter, especially the uh, supposedly youth group called the Imbonera Kuri, who have a, a really, really bad record of violence. And, and, and so, we're, we're, again, it's very, very tense. We're very concerned that it could explode. Clearly, some effort on the part of the government to make sure it doesn't happen, but they need to do a maximum effort and the opposition as well, because uh, the sort of the explosion could, could start on either side. Rupert Colville there speaking to me a little earlier on from the UN Human Rights Commission. In other news, protesters and police clashed in Senegal once again on Wednesday, a day after a student was killed during another demonstration. That rally was against delays in the payments of grants. Police were called in after students protesting late payments, insisted on eating at university restaurants for free. 25-year-old Mohamed Falusene was reportedly shot dead. Kenya has brought in a new law to crack down on cybercrime. Its supporters claim that it's in response to the rise of online harassment, scams and fake news. Offenders face up to two years in jail, but media rights activists fear that it could be used to criminalise free speech and that journalists and bloggers would be the main targets of the charges. 4,000 doses of an experimental Ebola vaccine arrived in Kinshasa on Wednesday in response to the latest outbreak of the disease there. They're being sent to rural areas of Equator province, where 39 suspected cases of the disease have been logged, including 19 deaths. 500 contacts are now being traced. Well, South Africa is currently hosting NAMPO 2018, one of the biggest agricultural fairs in the Southern Hemisphere. As farmers and exhibitors displayed their livestock and swapped ideas, picking up trade, the issue of land reform was also a central topic of discussion. Debates centred around the ANC government's proposed amendment to the constitution to allow land redistribution without compensation, a radical and controversial step to tackle a racial economic divide. Land is a very sensitive issue in South Africa. It's not only about the question of finding quick answers to give land to people and think, that will solve the problem. I think it's a, it's a deeper emotional issue and one of human dignity. Why is, is uh, um, property rights so important to us? You know, you get the accusations you only want to protect uh, the so-called white farmers. There's nothing wrong to also protect those people, but that's not a, the only reason. The, the reason is we know that the economy will be destroyed if this happens. Well, the idea of land redistribution without compensation has led to a spike in the number of land occupations where people forced out of demolished informal settlements. Cape Town in particular has ramped up the crackdown on unauthorised structures on private or public land, and that often leads to confrontations with the people living in them. Our correspondents report. When the anti-land invasion unit arrives in an informal settlement, people start marking their territory. And most of the time, the situation becomes volatile. 14 people were injured last week in a similar operation. Just chase them off, just chase them off, don't shoot. Hey, stop the operation, stop the operation. Go back, fall back, fall back, fall back. Commander Peterson destroys more than a thousand shacks with his unit every month. But he sometimes feels it's better to retry another day than confront the anger of the population. A lot of times it's hostile, yes. All right, so we will regroup and we'll come back, but we will do it at another day. They will come back with the help of the police force. This unit needs armed support as it's very unpopular. Their mission is to demolish any structure erected on public or private land. Their methods are radical. People who are not relocated are often desperate, like this woman who decided to strip off her clothes. Or this man from Port Elizabeth, who last April threatened to throw his baby if his shack was to be demolished. 
In Cape Town, the anti-land invasion boss is worried. He says their operations have tripled in a year and evictions are increasingly dangerous. We are actually at the, the, uh, in authority position, but they are taking us now. You must, the question is, where do you stop? As, as I said, uh, it also happened that uh, they are also shooting live rounds and it becomes more dangerous because it happened. It becomes it com completely out of, out of our range now. These officers say the government's promises to redistribute land without compensation have worsened the situation. There's a couple of structures to be demolished in Great Point, um, Kaya Litsa. The city of Cape Town is providing 10,000 houses a year, but they would have to build 10 times faster to catch up with the backlog. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.